How's it going, everyone? Buck up in far north Queensland on a rainy old day here in Innisfail. I was sitting here watching YouTube and I thought, well, if I'm sitting on the computer, I might as well do a reaction video up. You know, I love reacting to military stuff, um, police corrections, uh, all that type of stuff. Sports, haven't done any sports ones yet, but keep an eye out. That's coming up. Today, I'm going to react to a series uh, that was on TV a long time ago, and it's called Ladies in Lines. And it's about a young female platoon going through basic training in the Australian Army. And there's not a lot of stuff on the internet about the Australian Army or, or the training, and that lot of stuff on the Marines, the US Army, and uh, what have you. But the Australian Army isn't really camera friendly, guys. There's a lot of stuff goes on beyond the scenes. But they took a, a TV crew through. And they filmed a young uh, platoon of young Aussie females going through Kapuka basic training. Uh, 1RTB, 1st Recruit Training Battalion at a little place called Kapuka, just outside Wagga Wagga in New South Wales. Home of the soldier, they call it. And that's where I went through basic training in 1982. And um, I was assigned, for those who, who don't know much about me, guys, I went through basic training. 1982 was a young 17-year-old. I was the same age as some of these young girls here. Still wet behind the wet behind the ears. Thought I was growing up, but I wasn't. <laughs> the first night at Kapuka, I realised that, oh boy, I'm not as bloody big and as tough as I thought I was. But anyway, I went through in 1982, guys. Uh, I got assigned. Back in my day, you couldn't, if you join the army now, you basically know what your job you're going to do before you go into the army. When I went in, you went through and they told you what you were going to do. You could put three preferences down. Didn't mean you necessarily got them. In my case, I was what they call CP3, Colour Perception 3, which was colourblind. I didn't know I was colourblind until I went for the army and they put those Ishihara cards in front of me with all the different dots and that. And they said, what number's in there? And I said, 23. And they said, it's a bloody eight, you diddly donk. It's not a 23. I said, oh, I can see 23. So anyway, they said, you're colorblind, mate. You are you can only go to four cores back then, Signals Corps, Ordnance Corps, Catering Corps, which is uh, cooks and stewards, and Medical Corps to be a, a medic. Uh, medic had no position. So <laughs> I, get, I put down for Catering Corps. I thought, oh, I'll be a cook. I'll get a trade out of this. No, nah, you're going to Signals Corps. Rogers. So I, was, I did 19 years in signals units, guys. And my last year as a warrant officer class two, I spent up in Papua New Guinea as a defence advisor up there training the PNG soldiers. I had a great career, 20 years, uh, went through the ranks and had a fantastic time. 1997, um, we basically, uh, I was a, like a squadron quartermaster. We got chucked out of signals corps and the army put all their clerical staff and their, their, QEs, we used to call them, um, logistical type people, all got thrown over to Ordnance Corps, which is why I've got an Ordnance badge on my slouch hat, but I managed to stick it out 19 years in signals unit. People say, what corps were you in, Buck? I always go, I was in SIGs, because I was. I spent 19 years in SIGs units. I did all my promotion subject two courses th through RA SIGs and that, so I always say I was in signals corps, because that's what I specialised in. And did a lot of other stuff too, guys. We'll go into that in, in other things. But when I went through Kapuka, it was a male environment only. There were no the only female you saw at Kapuka was maybe a medic or something that someone had been through basic training, got a trade, and you might see the odd medic or a cook that was a female. Otherwise, it was a male dominated place. There were no female platoons going through. This ladies in lines, part five, I'm going to show you was from 1988. So this is a year, six years after me. But at this time, 1988, I was a corporal at 103 Signal Squadron at Laverack Barracks 3 Brigade in Townsville. So at the making of this, I was already a, a corporal, guys. My brother, the Gigi Gorilla, Ken, he went through in 1987. And he said, I asked him the other day, I said, were the females at Kapuka when you went through? He said, yes, but separate platoons. They weren't amalgamated. If you go through basic training now, and I don't agree with this decision, I think it's lowered the standard. People will probably throw rocks at me for saying that. It's true. It's fact. They now have male and female platoons. I don't agree with that. Males have got to be separated or you will not get the best out of them. Okay? You'll bring them to the level of the females and they don't 
they don't excel. Back in my day with an all-male platoons, you were competing against other males, guys, and you you had to you had to put in 110% or you got left behind. And I've been in units where females and that have been there and nothing against the girls. They're very good in a lot of areas in the, in the military. Very good. But they just, on average, they just didn't have the same standard as a male. There were some, there were some girls out there who were very good runners. They could bloody outrun me on a, a PT run or whatever, especially when I started getting a little bit older later in my career when I started coming across uh, females in units. When I joined the Army, there were no females in field force units whatsoever, okay? And it wasn't until the early 90s that they allowed females to come into field units, okay? And now females are in infantry battalions and that, which is, we'll save that for another another chat with maybe Kaz from In the Trenches with Kaz. That's a, a whole new bloody can of worms there. So Gigi went through in 1987, guys. He was an all-male platoon. He said there were female platoons there, and but they were separate. They were just all female platoons, the way I believe it should be. This is from 1988. Uh, you'll see it's a, an all-female platoon. Now, listen, it is 1988. Remember that. The Army's changed a lot back here. They've got SLRs. They haven't got styres, and they're in greens, not camouflage uniforms and, and all that type of stuff. The girls in this are 17 years old. They're young kids. So you've got to remember that. They're young kids, and you'll see that there's a couple of immature ones here that are – it's like they've just come out of high school and gone into the army, and they don't know if their ass is pointing up or down. I was a bit like that myself, guys, at 17. So it's called Ladies in Lines. It's available on YouTube, the whole series. I forget how many, uh, how many parts there is. This is part five. This is going – this isn't on day one, okay? This is further on in their training, probably three quarters of the way through. And um, some of them don't make it. Some of them do. And um, I, I think there's a they show their march out parade. And anyway, hopefully a lot of the young girls in here went on to have a, a good career in the military. Who knows? Some of them might have did what I did. Went on, did 20 years, got promoted up through the ranks and, and had a wonderful career in the Army. I hope they did anyway. Uh, there's one girl in here that didn't, and you'll see that when I um, show the video. I'll stop the video through, and we'll talk about things because there's a lot of stuff in here. I want to tell you, like the the barracks, the beds, the bedside tables, the lockers, exactly when I went through Kapuka. First thing I noticed is it's not as brutal as an all-male platoon. It's a bit gentler, um, just human nature, I guess, the way they talk to the the girls, the section commanders and that, there's a bit of yelling and screaming, uh, but certainly not as much as an all-male platoon. It was it was pretty brutal. Uh, when you weren't up to standard, you just got your face ripped off all the time. There was no uh, touchy-touchy things that you'll see through this. We'll talk about that anyway. Okay, let's get in and watch this video. Ladies in Lines, part five. Righto. So you see here, they're well into their training and they're going through some sort of probably just done the obstacle course. They're doing what we used to call battle PT. I'll just uh, maximize that so you can see it a bit better. It is old film. It's a bit grainy and that. It's probably from the old VHS <laughs> video days. Still got the old L1A1 SLRs, self-loading rifle, 7.62. Boy, oh boy, weren't they? Uh, they, they had some clout about them, those things. And... Uh, Big, long, heavy things compared to the Steyr. Um, they were actually a rifle, weren't they? You know, I went to a, I went from carrying that to a, uh, an F-88 carbine Steyr, which was just so much more beautiful to shoot and everything. It really was. So anyway, this section's going through doing battle PT, probably about to do the obstacle course and all that type of stuff. Come on, it's out, it's out. If you don't know, Kapooka's in New South Wales. This is probably around winter time, and you can hear we used to go through. They put us through this type of stuff, and I'll tell you what: when your balls hit that water, it was like you're talking like Mickey Mouse or Minnie Mouse. It was freezing down there. Yeah, it was best to go through in spring or autumn, not in summer because it was stinking hot in summer, and it was freezing cold in winter. And that water was bloody cold. Oh. 
keep moving or you'll freeze up. Yeah. Move the left hand side of the creek there. Come on. First thing here is just the intensity of, of them going through the water and that here. Just, I don't know. It just seems to be no, no, I don't know, through here, you'd be yelling and screaming and bloody going a, a thousand mile an hour. They are just very slow compared to a, a male platoon. Let's go. You want to Watch your pudding. Watch your pudding. Come on, keep your weapon up. Keep your weapon up. This section commander here sounds like he's a pom, got a pommy accent. But, you know, like if that was the males there, he'd be yelling and screaming and, and carrying on. You can see how they take it a little bit more gentler on the girls. Don't don't get me wrong, they had a hard time. But he, he does a good job here. He's he's a, he's pushing them along, but he's, he's trying to encourage them at the same time. Well, you move out there. Well, you go around that way. Come on up, you get on your feet. Out you go. Underneath. Of course, you this way. Oh, shorty. Get your weapon out of the bloody water. I push right, that's what you get. Let's go right away. You go under there. You can see they're young kids, aren't they? They're they're all about seventeen years old, buddy. This is probably nasty, but there was an old, there was a joke in the military that the recruiters they used to send all the good-looking ones to the air force and the navy, and all the tomboys went to the army. Oh. <laughs> Oh, I'm only joking when I say that. It's right there. Well, you go. Keep your weapon out of the water. Keep your weapon out of the water. I'll tell you now, but the army training for the girls was a hell of a lot harder than it would have been for the Navy and the Air Force girls, let me tell you. At least these girls are doing doing the hard yards. <laughs> Keep your weapon out. That's the ticket. Good girl. Well, there you go. Keep your weapon straight. She doesn't. Weapon out of the water. Straight down. Follow the creek line. Good. Well done. So he's offering a bit of encouragement. With us, it would have been, we, we didn't get a lot of encouragement. It was just frigging hurry up, it was screaming. And if you if you you weren't up to speed, you got your face ripped off. Um, a lot more aggression for a, a male platoon going through this thing. Um, <laughs> these girls are like a wet week going through this creek. Keep your weapons out of the water. You've got to fire these things. The toughest one on the girls is the female section commander. She gets up them. And as you can see there, they've got the old jungle greens on, all Vietnam uh, era. The old webbing, which was uncomfortable as buggery. Uh, you know, you got your harnesses there, your bum pack on, the SLR with a sling. And you know what? So you see what the SLR's going through here, through water and mud and all that type of stuff. The next morning, she stripped apart on a on your bedside table and had to be gleaming, had to be absolutely immaculate getting a weapons inspection. So that thing there, it didn't stay clean for long, but as soon as you got back to the barracks, you had it stripped apart and you were cleaning it. Just... No sense of urgency, is there? They're just like bloody a gaggle of, a gaggle of chooks. They really are. When we did this, we were we were running through, guys. We were sprinting through. We are just bloody ploughing through. Uh, we just, they're just on a bloody Sunday afternoon stroll. Come on, get up, we know. Come on, get up, we know. A lot of the girls got their hands wrapped around the the pistol grip and that, the girl behind here, I just missed it. Finger outside the trigger guard, ready to go. So you can safety catch down and you're ready to go. So it's just little things like this. You learn that as you go, how to hold the weapon properly so that if you need to engage a target, safety catch off and then, you know, they've got their hands wrapped around the, the trigger guard and that. Um, but that'll come with future future training. Not easy running. Oh, everything's wet. You double the weight. Your uniform and your webbing and everything's double the weight. Get up to him. Climb double. This poor girl struggles through the whole thing, guys. 
Come on, keep with me. Go, come on. Keep with me. We used to run out. The range was like eight kilometres away. We used to run out in boots, webbing and rifle. We'd run to the range and then run back. Sometimes they, if they were on a tight time schedule, the bus might come and pick you up. But if you did something wrong, they'd say, oh, we're running back. And it just left you with no time to do anything else. And I'll tell you what, it wasn't there. That's why we've got stuffed backs and knees and ankles and all that type of stuff now. Because r- running in boots and webbing and rifle and that, for 20 years, takes its toll on your body. Come on. Up here. Up here. The way the section commander, the female section commander, that's called running at the trail. Uh, at the trail, hand gu- the handguard used to fold out and you used to be able to run with the rifle by your side using the hand. That was at the trail, they called it. Come on, white boy. 25 past 12 now. The bus is picking you up at 13.15. So you got three calls an hour to have a shower, get dressed, get to lunch, get back, clean your weapons, get up, get the bus. And- that didn't change. Did you hear that? If you didn't understand what just happened then, have a look at them. They're wet, muddy. Their weapons are being through mud and water. And they've just been told they've got 45 minutes to get back to the barracks, have a shower, get changed into a clean uniform, get their rifles clean, get to lunch and have a feed and be back down here for the first lesson after lunch, which who knows what that could have been. Could have been a drill lesson. Could have been a weapons lesson. So I'm going to back. You have a look at the on their face because as soon as she said you got 45 minutes, you've got to have a shower. You've got to get into a new um, uniform. You've got to clean your weapon. So what get, what gives lunch? All right, I don't know how many times that you just didn't have time to go to the mess and eat. And if you did, you'd you'd smash it down your throat as quick as you could and get back to the barrack. You just didn't have time to scratch your ass at basic training. You have a listen, and you watch the faces on the girls. They look at each other as if to go, "Well, there goes lunch." You got three calls an hour to have a shower, get dressed, get to lunch, get back, clean your weapons, get up, get the bus. Understand? <laughs> That's the. She's fucking kidding, mate. Yes, man. I know about this loser. So this female over here is the platoon commander. Uh, back in the day, could have been a second lieutenant or a lieutenant in the Australian Army. We say lieutenant, not lieutenant. Okay, that's for the Navy. And for the Americans in the Australian Army, it's lieutenant, the same as the British Army. Some of these people coming here now have obviously been to the the medical, over to the RAP, Regimental Aid Post, which is the medical section. Some people went there to try and get out of the hard work. Some, Some legitimately had bloody injuries. But the trouble is, if you went there, and you came back with a chit, you were just called a malingerer. A malingerer is someone who just tries to get out all the hard work and, and dodge. And you used to get that in the army. You used to get malingerers, people who get medical chits to try and get out of hard PT sessions and whatever. Sometimes they'll fair dinkum. But um, when the going gets tough, some the, the tough get going and the weaklings, a lot of the time, end up at the medical centre. I'm not saying this girl is, but... By the sounds of the instructors, she's making a habit of it. I'll, put, I'll go back again and watch that. Listen to what the section commander says here. Couple Lloyd. This man. I know about this loser. Is it? He's already written her off as a malingerer. Four tablets. All right, come and keep hold of that until the end of the day. Come and see me when you want your tablets. That's a half ass march. Every time we went up and down that hallway, we had to march with our march with our arm up shoulder high everywhere we went. As soon as you come out of your room, you are marching. And at the end of that corridor is the SAL block, showers and latrines, okay, the shitter.
And I don't know if it was like that, but for us, there was a chin-up bar there, a heaving beam, they used to call it in the army. And every time we went through that door, we had to do maximum chin-ups, have a shit, come out, maximum chin-ups on the way out. Every time you went through that door, every time you went to the mess for breakfast, lunch and dinner, there was a chin-up bar outside the mess and a corporal would sit there and everybody, you had to march to the mess with your plastic cup in your hand and you had to do maximum chin-ups on the way in and on the way out, heaves we used to call them, like over grasp or under grasp. And basically, every just about every male recruit that went through Kapuka could do 20 chin-ups by the time they got out of Kapuka because you just did them everywhere you went. The girls don't. I don't think the girls did them. So if we marched like that down the corridor and got caught do, marching like her, we would have got a face ripping. So he's just let that slide now, that section commander. He should have been ripping it up her. Eh? Listen in 31. It's obviously 31 platoon. Um, I don't know. Char uh, Delta Company, maybe. What do they say? You had heat treatment on it. Well, they say it was a back problem or not? No x-rays? She says shaking her head. If we shook our head at our section commander, he would have punched us in the throat. That, that was just another no-no. It was either yes, corporal, or no, corporal. Yes, sergeant. No, sergeant. Yes, sir. No, sir. Just sit there shaking your head. He would have said, don't shake your fucking head at me or I'll knock it off. That's what they would have said to us. But you can see here, just the standards of the girls compared to, I only went through six years before this, guys, and I'll tell you what, it was there were some big differences. Nothing at you. All right, keep the chip with you until uh, the spies can come and come and see me. You know, just walk off. No, yes, corporal, and I don't know. You know I can see the standards are slipping already here compared to when I went through. Half, 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 half. Look, what? See here, they're the beds, the bedside tables and that that we used to use. And you can see there they got their weapons. They're probably back from lunch. They've changed. They got their weapons cleaned. At no stage were you allowed to lie on your bed unless you were about to go to sleep at 10 o'clock at night and it was lights out. You can see <laughs> this one, if one for one reason, if you got caught, you were dead. The second reason, if you messed it up, it, you were shit. So when you were down doing your drill lesson, if the, cor the corporals of the platoon, they go through and do a barracks inspection while you were down, and we quite often would come back and our beds would just be flipped up because they, were, they weren't to speed. That one there with a the rifle on it, that wouldn't have passed inspection. And we often came back and our beds were flipped all the time. I found me bed out the window a few times. They just did that all the time. If your foot locker wasn't locked, if your main locker wasn't locked, it went on the floor or out the window. So that's why that girl's sleeping on those plastic chairs because you're not allowed to sleep on your bed. And even if you were, you'd have to remake it. Making your bed in the morning, sheets used to have to come off the bed and um, the best way to make the beds in the morning was double up. You didn't try and do it by yourself. You worked, you worked with your roof side. There was two on that side of the room, a partition and two on the other side. So four to a room. And I lived like that right up until the early 90s, guys, living in barracks like that. And um, yeah, so you'd work as a pair to make your bed where you see the sheets folded down there, the green sheets and the orange counterpane. We used to call it a counterpane, and it had the, the Australian Army Rising Sun badge on it. And that green sheet where it got folded down had to be one SLR bayonet's length, precisely. And the corporals would bring it in and put a bayonet down. If it wasn't a bayonet thing, your bed got flipped. So they're probably just waiting. They've probably got five minutes until they've got to go 31 platoon, form up downstairs, three ranks. And then you, you grab your gear, you make sure all your everything's locked. Everything had to be locked, that the 
table personnel there, your foot locker, everything had to be locked. The bloody floors, we used to have to polish them and they give us a floor polisher. And on room inspection, they would be glowing, like just pristine. You could see your face in the floors. We used to, every now and then, we'd, we'd take the wax off and then we'd put new floor wax down and then you'd get the, the polisher. And it was just shiny, shiny, smooth floors. <laughs> I'm playing the truck in the background. <laughs> with their nose. What so what's happening here? It'll be morning time, and this is the um, the company commander. He's a major, a rank of major, and he'd be coming and it'd be OC's inspection. So this was a big inspection. Every morning, the corporals or the section commanders would do an inspection. And then sometimes it will be platoon sergeant's inspection. So the platoon sergeant would come down or it'd be platoon commander's inspection. And then it would be the company sergeant major, the warrant officer, would come over and do an inspection. And the big one would be the OC's inspection. The officer commanding, he's a major. And you can see there, the only people who wore the peak caps and they were a smart-looking cap back then were warrant officers and officers wore the peak caps. They were the only ranks that did it. And when you got went through the ranks and you got promoted to warrant officer class two and warrant officer class one, we used to say, um, got me cap, which means you've just been promoted to warrant officer. And it was just a special thing to get promoted to warrant officer and get your cap. Never, ever wore it. I was never, we were in camouflage uniforms by then. We never wore it with uh, cams. You could wear it with your polyester uniform. I... I got my cap. I don't know where it is to this day, and I don't think I ever, ever wore it in the army. I, I, I just wore a slouch hat. Step up. Every time an officer or even the corporals entered your room for an inspection, one of the recruits would have to go stand fast, everyone come to attention, and you didn't salute the corporals or the platoon sergeant, but if it was an officer that was doing the inspection, one of the recruits, it'd be a nominated recruit, uh, usually the one directly as they walk through the door, would go stand fast, all four recruits come to attention, and that recruit there salutes. Morning, sir. Morning, guys. Fine, thank you. Good afternoon. Fine, thank you, sir. SLR stripped apart on the uh, personnel table there. And it had to be stripped right down, like a full field strip, not a field strip, a full strip and assembly with the handguard, everything off. And boy, oh boy, if that rifle was not up to speed, you knew all about it. A lot of them did that. Where are you from? Oh, Gold Coast, sir. Or some people would go, oh, Perth. or Because recruits were from all around Australia all around Australia, and you could only tell where recruits were from, from their regimental number. Queenslander started with one, New South Wales two, Victoria three, South Australia four, five was, Jesus, five was Western Australia, six was Tasmania, and where was seven? Seven was the ACT, I think, and eight was the Northern Territory, and it was a six-figure regimental number. Mine was one eight double two. Nine six, that was my regimental number. I remember it until the day I die. Army Reserve people, they had a seven a seven digit number. So the Gigi Gorilla who went through the Army Reserve and then joined the regs. Speaking of which, um, they had a seven digit number. Mm. <coughs> so even the magazine stripped apart push out, take the base plate off, the spring come out, even had to strip your magazines apart, and even they had to be clean. Obviously, if you have mud in your magazine, rounds won't feed in properly. So everything was inspected. And do not ever use Brasso on your gas plugs. If they ever found bra Brasso was good, Brass Cleaner was good for getting the carbon off your gas plug. But boy, oh boy, if they saw a smidgen of Brasso, 
on your gas plug, you were fucked because it was taboo to use it on there. It did a good job. <laughs> it used to get the carbon off. But boy, oh boy, if you got caught using it. Bain it, SLR Bain it. The old bush hat or giggle hat, we used to call it. That jumper she's got on there is called a Howard Green. Okay. A Howard Green. And we used to have to starch up the bloody, the, the epaulette and the, that green patch. You had to starch that up. A Howard Green uh, sweater, it was called. And we'd often, later on in the units, you get girls ringing up the guard room saying, hello, I'm looking for... I'm after Howard Green. I met him on Friday night. So you've been had, love. <laughs> Blokes used to get soldiers go into town, pick up a Sheila, and they and then tell the Sheila that their um, name was Howard Green or something, which is the name of the jumper. You haven't done this at all? That's the entrenching tools, fold out shovel, entrenching tool. She didn't uh, oil that which he probably forgot to do it or didn't think to do it, but he's got a good point. Anything that's metal, put some oil on it. Okay, it's metal on metal moving parts. Make sure it's oil. He's got an artillery badge on there, from what I can see. Uh, artillery officer. When did you last polish your brass? When you hear that, when did you last polish your brass? That's... I'm fucked, because... The officers won't do much about it, but when he, the moment he leaves, this female, she's gone. Her section commander will rip her a new one because her brass wasn't up to speed. That locker there, guys, everything had to be immaculate. Our handkerchiefs had to be starched and folded and had to be exactly the same size. Our, our green boxer shorts, which we used as underpants, had to be everything had to be folded and had there was a way to fold everything and if it wasn't exactly the way the army wanted it done it wasn't up to speed and I'll tell you what the amount of times my locker come flying out all over the floor I lost count a lot more work yeah so she'll she'll cop some punishment for that after he goes officers didn't go throwing shit out of your locker and all that are a bit more civilised. But the section commanders, even the sergeants didn't do that. They'd leave that up to the section commanders, the corporals. And the corporals were, they were like the, the pit bulls. <laughs> they were the angriest people at Kapuka. You built. Yeah. Did you call his rifle through the crew? Yes, sir. There's another dunk moment. Did you pull this rifle through? Which means she's growing potatoes down the barrel. This girl here is just a what we used to call a heat seeker. She just can't stay out of trouble. Hey, you got trouble with one man. What do you do? Play the sheep, did you? Yes, sir. Not good enough. What do you use? Service from the lips, sir. Well, I suggest you clean the yard. Yeah. Once again, her section commander's going to tear her a new one once this uh, officer goes. Service for Lanolette was the, the proper flannelette material you used to rip a, a certain size put it in your pull through and that's what you used to put a bit of oil on it and pull the barrel of the slr through we've got tabs here red yellow and black tabs we didn't have tabs and that signified what part of training you were on which part of your three months so you might have red tabs the first month yellow and then black or oh, oh, black red, yellow, I don't know what order it was. We didn't have tabs when we went through. It's so that officers and, and other NCOs, if they saw recruits and they had red tabs on they and they weren't really up to speed, you could say, all right, they're not as good as they should be because they're only on their red tabs. Starting by the way. Yes, sir. Fruit wide, born. She got to the toilet. She still can't clean a rifle. The officers just... Just said to the section commander, her rifle wasn't up to speed. And she's, look, look at the look on her face there, poor bugger. She knows, she's thinking to herself, right now, I'm fucked. And that's, yeah. She's only young, isn't she? Look at her, she's probably 17. Probably just coming out of bloody grade 10 at school. Thanks, sir. 
That female there, Lieutenant, is it? She's uh, Transport Corps, Royal Australian Corps of Transport. Back in those days, we didn't wear a core badge. Uh, I forget what year it was, but they started wearing a, your core badge on the front of your slouch hat. Um, uh, back in the back in the eighties, you didn't do that. That's a platoon sergeant there, the three stripes. So that's the platoon sergeant taking notes, and probably the platoon commander. So each you got three sections to a platoon of about 10, 10, 10 girls in each section. Each section has a section commander, a corporal in charge of them, and then you've got a platoon sergeant and a platoon commander. Platoon commander will be a lieutenant. Three platoons to a company. He's the company commander. So things are getting worse for this poor girl. The platoon sergeant is now checking her weapon out. He doesn't look impressed. Right, now you have a look through that bloody barrel. Yes, sir. What can you see? You can't see out the other end, can you? <laughs> if you can't see out the other end of your barrel, that's not good. You're supposed to see a nice, round, shiny, clear tunnel through your barrel. And she said, I can't see any. She probably can't see anything because of the glasses she's got on the poor thing. But she can't see out of a barrel, which means there's probably mud still up there from when she did the obstacle course. And you'll see a bit later on. It doesn't go well for her. You know why? See how he's talking like he's, he's ripping her a new one in a low voice. You don't have to yell and scream all the time. Probably for us, he would have said to a male recruit by now, as soon as the company commander leaves, you're fucked. That's what he would have said to us. But he's been a bit more tactful with the girls. There's a bloody veggie patch in between. See, growing spuds up the barrel. Bloody disgusting. Bloody disgusting. Yeah, it's a, it's a, I've been there where... They pick up something wrong during the inspection. Your rifle's not up to speed. Your brass isn't up. Your brass isn't polished enough. Your boots aren't shiny enough. And when they start pick, when they, you just know by their words, you know you're fucked. And there's repercussions for everything: punishment, extra work. This girl, buddy, she ends up getting charged, which isn't good. <laughs> Stuart, what are the standing orders for water bottles in the, in the lines in the wedding? No water in the sir. So this is water, what is it, brandy or whiskey? Water, sir. Brandy or whiskey. So your water bottles have got to be empty. You don't leave old water in your water bottles because it can go stagnant and then you refill them and next thing you're crook. And a crook soldier out bush is no good to anyone. See how they're teaching them all this at basic training. They're teaching them at basic training that you don't leave water in your water bottles. This is all where it all starts. And, and as I said, they make mistakes, but they're learning. When you make mistakes, you've got to learn from them. Some of the recruits didn't learn from their mistakes. They kept making the same mistakes, and that's where it just gets worse for you. All right, we all get used to get chipped on. on you never got through an inspection without getting chipped on something. I could be clumsy and drop it over your gear, but I won't. Empty that out. If he was a section commander, that water bottle would have gone over everything. He's an officer, so he um, he's a bit more of a gentleman. Okay. You're having dust on your dust. What's that in there? Always? Smell that. Now you have to drink out of that, and you have to eat out of that, not me. The trouble is, you're going to come down with some kind of fever or stomach inflate in the field, and I'm going to have to replace you. See, he's teaching her. Didn't clean her um, cups, canteen, steel out. They they used to call it your your um 
your mud, we used to get two, and your water bottle would go in the same shape as your water bottle. Kidney, kidney cup is another nickname for it. With the males, one was for shaving out of out bush, and the other one was for your bruise and water. Don't get them mixed up. <laughs> you get a mouthful of whiskers. But boy, oh boy, if you got back from bush and your cup was still found with bloody shaving cream or whiskers or something in it, look out. Same again for the cross. Still, that's revolving. So these lockers and everything, I don't know what they got blue. I don't know. They, she got a nighting gown there. Maybe the girls were allowed to have that. Same lockers we had. Same exact everything. Your overall fine. locker layout is fine. Your boots are good. Your brass is good. But you're not paying attention to the hygienic things. Okay? Make sure they're clean. So that's not too bad. She got away okay. The section commanders will probably... Still get upper, but um, she's in nowhere near as much shit as the girl with the dirty rifle. She looks like a young boy, doesn't she? Only a young kid, just out of school. Yeah, this one wasn't the best, sir. Drop the cops, he can look at this weapon again so, later at your convenience. Thanks, sir. Okay, thank you. <laughs> So the platoon commander has now heard that private, uh, sorry, recruit Whiteborne or whatever her name was, that her weapon was not up to speed and the, the platoon commander's coming down to have a look now. So even more shit. The company commander wasn't happy. The platoon sergeant's probably gone up and said, man, go and have a look at recruit Whiteborne's rifle. It's a fucking shit fight. Have a See a, a black belt there, guys. That's what we used to call the brass. You got your brass and your, your two keepers. Her keepers are way too far apart. What you used to have to do is is when you put your your brass after you polish your brass, okay, with brasso, and then you it had to be absolutely sparkling your brass, and then you put it on your belt, okay, and try and put it on with your yellow brass cloth so that you didn't get fingerprints and all that over it. And then what you do is get your bread and butter knife and you get it in and you jam that keeper. Those two keepers had to be right up flush with their brass. Her keepers are way apart. Someone should have picked her up on that. They're nowhere near close enough together. She's a shower of shit, actually, isn't she? And this... This is where this goes south for this girl. They can't. Her weapon is that dirty and clogged up and, and unclean. They can't even cock it or rack it, as some people say. And this lieutenant needs a kick in the arse. She's trying to cock this weapon with the magazine still on it. Ma'am, not good enough. That's why officers shouldn't be allowed near weapons. <laughs> Leave that for the section commanders. Check safe. Remove the magazine and then cock the weapon. This lieutenant's trying to um, cock the weapon with a magazine on it, which is a no-no. But <laughs> she can't even cock it because the weapon's that dirty. This poor girl, she's just... I'd hate to think what's going through her head now. So, section commander's taken the magazine off the weapon, and now they've called her down to the um, instructor's office, and now they're getting her to cock the weapon, and she can't. That's that's bad, guys. That is bad. I don't think I've ever seen a weapon that bad that I haven't been able to cock it. You know, you go through an obstacle course and through mud and water, and then you get to the rain, you've got to fire that weapon. It still fires. You can still cock it. I don't know. She probably hasn't cleaned that weapon for days. Let's first off, what's the first thing you do when we strip the weapon? Hey, we take the sling off, don't we? He's Ordnance Corps, this corporal here. Okay. 
on there. Now, because I, I can't even cock it myself, so because I can't cock it, there's something illegal. He's going to take it around the corner away from the camera and he cocks it, he puts it on the ground and he cocks it with his foot. Now, you know that weapon's not in good order when a, a male, like he couldn't even cock it. My God, I, how long since she's cleaned it? So he jams his foot down on the cocking, fold the cocking handle out and he jams his foot down on it and cocks it that way. You shouldn't have to do that. Hear that? He just jammed his foot on the cocking handle. When did you like oil your weapon? Recruit Wyborn. I started to oil it yesterday. You started to. What do you mean you started to? Did you oil your weapon or didn't you? I started to. And... I started to. That's a no. Because I had to. Oh. What's this recruit Wyborn? What's this here? All that red stuff. That'd be rust. <laughs> the brown paint or rust? Rust. Rust. Two words that should never go together: weapon and rust. Go get your hat. Just and get back here. Just yeah. Not often the lieutenants uh, start getting involved like this and and bloody getting up ya. Yeah, she's stuffed up big time here for the platoon commander to to be getting into her. Once again, guys, if this was a male platoon, it wouldn't be as nice as what's happening here. And I think there's a camera there, which which is probably the instructors and everything have been told, hey, there's a television camera at this platoon. Um, keep everything above board type thing. So I can tell you now, if that happened in my, if that was me in 1982, I probably would have been, jammed up against that locker by now, grabbed around the throat, punched in the guts, had an ironing board wrapped around me, which happened to me, because my weapon wasn't up to speed. I'll tell you the story. I was getting doing a weapons test in the hallway one day with my section commander, and he went, load. And I forgot to check safe before I put the magazine on the weapon. He just grabbed the weapon off me, said, get in there, put me in a room, Picked up an ironing board and wrapped it around my back. And he said, don't ever fucking forget to check your safety catch again. And that's what used to happen in my day. And I didn't. Caution, Kawaiborn, that you are not obliged to, but may, if you wish, to do so, answer any questions or do anything. Ask of you by an investigating officer and that anything said or done by you may be used in evidence. You know what this means? What? I'm being charged for. I'll just read you the caution that we've got to read you before you're charged. Disciplinary action will be taken against you at a later stage. So she's going to be charged where she'll front the uh, the OC, that major, and she'll probably be awarded five or seven days CB, confined to barracks, which is you're confined to barracks anyway at Kapuka, or restriction of privileges. You're out on the parade ground till 11 o'clock at night drilling, you get stuffed around. So as if 5 a.m. to 10 p.m. isn't enough with what they've got to do, she'll be charged and then she'll have extra stuff to do. Like, for example, after 5 o'clock, she might have to report at 6 o'clock over to the um, the company headquarters to whoever, whoever the duty NCO is in polyester ceremonial. And then the next hour... She might have to go in green ceremonial or pajama ceremonial. <laughs> Just say pajama ceremony. You had to go over in your pajamas with your black belt on, your slouch hat. There's no such uniform. They used to just dick you around. So she's getting charged, and um, yeah, things are things are starting to go south for this young girl. I'll question you at a later stage. Go. Once again, because the camera's there, this would have this would have gone a lot worse if the camera wasn't there on tipping. It's not as normally as nice as this. She got about three steps and she's back again. You get your rifle right now. 
Reality setting in for this young girl now. Like she knows she's fucked. And uh, emotions are taken over. And I feel sorry for her, but yeah, yeah, there's no room. You've got to, you got to toughen them up. You either make it or you don't. It felt like that. Sorry for talking so much, guys, but it was like that at Kapuka. Sometimes when things went wrong, they just, you just kind of got in a hole. You couldn't get out of it. You just felt like you're always in the shit for something. All right. And it was a bloody horrible feeling, which is what she's going through there now. And it was good to be the grey man. Pass everything. Don't draw the crabs. Do well on your on your room inspections and your, your weapons training. Out on the drill square. Don't draw the crabs, as we used to say. And, and you could coast along all right. But as soon as you started bloody getting in a hole, it was like it just, you couldn't get off the, the slippery slope. And that this girl here is she's going down at a great rate of knots. Mark, time, halt, left turn. So she's getting charged now. She's over to the OC, the major, and she's her charge has been uh, heard. I don't know if it'll be section section sixty, which was bloody um, prejudicial behaviour. That was the old um, ham, cheese, and tomato. I used to cover everything. The tarpaulin, the tarpaulin thing. I used to cover anything prejudicial behaviour. <laughs> I don't know if there was one for actually uh, a dirty weapon, but section sixty of the defence. Force DFDA, Defence Force Discipline Act, prejudicial behaviour. I can't believe I still remember that shit. Hello, he's an officer. About three weeks ago, I spoke to you here. I counselled you on your performance, your lack of motivation, drive, and organisational skill. Do you recall that last meeting? Yes, sir. At that stage, I gave you I gave you till the end of phase one to improve before I looked at putting you into remedial training platoon for further training. Yes. Okay, so there are... And this is why they're so raw, guys. They're still in phase one, which is the black tabs or navy blue, whatever colour they are. We didn't have that. They're still in phase one. And if you watch this, they, they, they get better and better. The longer they go, second phase, they start picking up. Third phase, they're starting to come together as a team. They, these, these girls are still in phase one, which is why... That's why they're not bloody performing real well. I get the impression at the moment that you're not trying. Is that a true or an accurate assumption? No, sir. You are trying. I've been, yes, sir. Do you really want to be a soldier in the Australian Regular Army? Yes, sir. On this stage, your weapons are well below standard. Your drill is well below standard. And your soldierly qualities are poor. Following this morning's locker inspection, I'm still not convinced your brass has been polished. Okay, so they didn't muck around. They charged her. And the same day, she's fronting the, the OC for a charge. Your locker layout was poor. Your boots were filthy. Your weapon was rusty. What's that thing on his desk there, that big green thing with the dial on it, guys? I intend recommending that you go to the remedial training platoon. Further training? Yes, sir. Before you rejoin a female platoon at a later stage. Should you not improve your performance whilst 51 platoon remedial training, a recommendation will go forward that you be discharged from the Army or discharged from one RTV as a training failure. Yes, sir. Do you understand that? Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. Basically, what he said there now is she's not up to speed that she, she's not up to the required standard. That was the old army terminology. Not up to the required standard of her platoon. She's behind. She's now being charged for dirty weapon. Her drill's not up to speed. Her weapons handling's not up to speed. 
they're big things at, at recruit training, weapons handling and bloody and drill and your locker inspections, all that type of stuff. She's not up to speed. He's sending her back to 51 platoon, which is the remedial training platoon. So she goes back there with all the other veg. Now, this is horrible. We used to call it in my day, it was called vegetable platoon. And that's why we used to say all the veggies go back to veggie platoon. And basically, they've got other training staff there who just try and bring them up to the standard, like get her standard better. And then when she gets to a certain standard, like she, if she's at week three of training here at the moment, they might send her to 51 platoon. She might do two, three weeks there. Who knows? Until she's up to standard. And then she'll go back and join another platoon that's at week three. She'll never come back to this platoon. She won't march out with her platoon now. She's getting back, not back squatted. She's getting sent to veggie platoon. And then she'll go into another platoon once she's at the required standard. Here's a horrible story for you. We had three guys got sent to veggie platoon out of my platoon. They weren't up to speed and they got sent back to veggie platoon. It's a horrible bloody word, isn't it? But this is how we used to talk back in those days. So the corporal's got us out in the hallway. We're in hallway 24 and we're, we're in the hallway and they marched the three guys out of the platoon and they said, Platoon, these three guys weren't up the standard. They're off the vegetable platoon. And as they walked or marched down the hallway, we had to sing one potato, two potato, three potato, four, sing the one potato song because they were going to vegetable platoon. And we got made sing that to them to shame them on the way out of the platoon. That's the type of stuff that happened. and Demoralising for these guys as if it's not bad that they're getting thrown out of their platoon and, and then they're not going to get to march out with us. They, you know, they go to veggie platoon, get up to speed, and then they go back to another platoon, and it puts their training right behind. Emphasise again, what you have to show is far more drive, a greater amount of motivation, and improve your learning ability. Yes, sir. I hope to see you back in the company in two to three weeks' time. Yes, sir. But I'll give you the fair warning now that if your performance does not improve, whilst a remedial training platoon, I shall recommend your discharge from the Army. Yes, sir. Is that clearly understood? Yes, sir. All right, recruit Wyborn, you've got a lot of... So she got to get up the speed at 51 platoon. If she doesn't, they'll piss her off out of the Army. What work to do in the next two to three weeks? Stand by. Yes, sir. Right through please. Yeah. Fingers apart on the salute. Left, be... Quick. Ah. Straight down the way. Don't know what happened with her dirty weapon. Maybe that was the... Ch I don't know. Maybe that was her punishment was being... Because she had a dirty weapon, her her punishment is getting sent to um, Veggie Platoon. What, what was the name? I can't remember now. Oh. Okay, just relax. Okay. Platoon sergeant has a chat to her here. Tries to tries to smooth things over a bit, and and he knows she's hurting at the moment. Um, in our day, with a platoon sergeant would have said, "Go in and pack your locker up and fuck off," and uh, that's what would have been said. But Major Smith just about covered it all. Okay, now he's feeling pretty upset at this stage. Okay, but it's probably the best thing for you. Um, what I want you to do now is go across to the lines, wipe your uh, your eyes dry, okay, and start getting your gear ready, okay? Uh, would I be able to have my uh, civilian locker keys as yeah, well? Yeah, there'll be someone over there in a minute to give you a civilian locker key. Civilian locker, when you get to Kapuka, you'll have a suitcase with all your civilian clothes. That gets confiscated and it goes into a locker room and you do not see that for three months. You do not wear civilian clothes for three months when you're at basic training. The next time you'll see those civilian clothes is when you get to your, for me, it was, we got on a bus after Kapuka and we went from Wagga Wagga on a bus down to Melbourne to the School of Signals at Watsonia. And that's the first time we were allowed to see our civilian clothes. 
Okay. Yes, Anything you want to say to me? Yes, Sergeant. Okay. It's in the best interest of you that you go to 51 Battalion. You know within yourself that you've, uh, you haven't been up to scratch, have you? Yes, Sergeant. Okay. And the way you're going, all you're doing is getting more CSMs, more ROPs, and just getting yourself in deep. CSMs, not sure what CSMs were. I can't remember what that was. ROPs, restriction of privileges. Um, yeah, once you're in a hole, it's hard to get out of it. Okay, in 51 Battoon, you'll be supervised a lot more, okay, because of the numbers, and they'll get you right up to scratch before you go to another platoon, as the OC said. All right? Yes, Sergeant. You're not being kicked out. You know that, don't you? After a short time in 51 platoon, recruit Wyborn accidentally stabbed herself with her bayonet. I don't know. To me, maybe she was having trouble over there. She self-harmed and was chucked out of the army. Maybe. I accidentally stabbed myself with a bayonet too, guys. I was trying to take it off the SLR and um, they get jammed every now and then and I did the wrong thing and went, dunk. <laughs> I got myself fair in the forehead, went down to the bone too. Let me tell you, it was claret everywhere. They come in and went, Recruit Rogers, what are you doing? I said, oh, I accidentally got myself with a bone. And they said, you fuckwit. We see it every bloody intake. Some cockhead takes the bone off their SLR and it's hard to get and you put a lot of, and then he goes, dunk, <laughs> you get yourself in the forehead. I did it. I'm ashamed to say it. Uh, sounds like this young girl may have self-harmed. Self and was discharged from the army. So if you do see this, if you're out there, I hope whatever happened to you after this, I hope you went on and 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 went on to bigger and better things and, and was a success in whatever you did. The army's not for everyone. And people are probably thinking, oh, she was hopeless and all that type of stuff. She was just too young. You know, maybe if she joined a couple of years later, guys, she might have got through okay. I just put it down. She's just immature. She's probably only 17. She's a young kid, immature, probably a, a mummy's girl. Yeah, um, just didn't have what it took to get through. And if you can't make it going back to 51 platoon, um, you know, maybe she wasn't met for the army. Maybe recruiting let her down, okay? Maybe, I don't know, maybe she shouldn't have got through the recruiting phase and even got to Kapuka. I don't know. But let's hope she's okay anyway. And, you know, what's this bloody... 40 years ago, 30, nearly 40 years ago. Rightio. I'll get rid of that. Go back to this one. And we're back. What did you think of that one, guys? Ladies in Lines, part five. There's a whole series on it. And it basically shows them from the start. That was still very early. Um, I think later in the series, you see the girls starting to get better. You see them coming together, working as a team. And um, at the end, they march out as a proud platoon in front of their families. And they all go off to different corps. Back in those days, girls couldn't go to an arms corps. Infantry, artillery, armoured engineers, um, they were allowed to go to signals and all that. And even back in those days, they weren't even allowed to go to a field force unit. They used to have to go to a static unit, we used to call them, um, like to a medical centre or a medical hospital if they were in medics or they they weren't allowed to go to a field unit and drive bloody Unimog trucks and all that type of stuff. It wasn't until the early 90s, 91 I think it was, females were allowed to start going to field force units. So those girls there all would have gone to a static unit environment and not had to go field and all that type of stuff. But every Australian soldier goes through Kapuka, you get trained up to be a soldier. You get trained to do the basic soldierly skills, drill, weapons, hygiene, discipline, all that type of stuff. Um, so anyway, hope you enjoyed that. If you wanted me to do another reaction, I know I talk a lot, guys, but I've got to I like to explain what's happening in the background because I know a lot of civilians out there are watching this and probably doesn't mean much to them. So I'm trying to explain to you what's happening there. That was very, very like the lockers, the beds, 
the hallways, everything was the same as when I went through basic training. There was just a lot more yelling and screaming. I'm sure the female platoons had that as well. I think it was toned down a bit because there was a television camera there. So, but anyway, well done to the girls that got through that platoon. And as I said, it's co-ed now. I don't agree with that. I don't agree that males and females should be in the same platoon because you imagine a, a male that's got a lot of potential and he's in a platoon that's got some of the some girls like that one there and they're just not getting the best out of them. I think males and females need to be split through basic training. But anyway, they'll call me an old dinosaur for saying that. Anyway, guys, let me know what you reckon in the comments. Take it easy. Be good to each other, eh? And we'll catch you again soon, eh, for another reaction. See ya.